Hello, my name is Charles Upton. I'm going to read something called The About Face of the Contemporary American Left. But before I do, if anyone has any idea how I might get in touch with Muhammad Ali Jr., please leave uh, some advice in the uh, comments section below. The About Face of the Contemporary American Left. In the 1980s, when I was most deeply involved in liberal leftist politics in the context of the opposition to U.S. military intervention in Central America, the left was so different from the so-called left of today that we ought to invent a different name for it. In the 1980s, the left supported the labor movement, now it scorns the working class. It welcomed Glasnost and Perestroika and supported detente with Russia, now Russia is the enemy. Its social analysis was centered on class, now it's mainly based on race and gender, while class analysis is de-emphasized. And it certainly believed in freedom of speech. One of the intrinsic moral principles of the older left was, in Evelyn Beatrice Hall's famous paraphrase of Voltaire, I may not believe in a thing that you say, but I will defend it to the death your right to say it. Now it routinely calls for freedom of speech to be curtailed. The CIA was the feared and hated enemy. Now those who condemn the CIA are called right-wing extremists. The U.S. left of today is a textbook case of a social movement thoroughly infiltrated by change agents and completely denatured and recast by social engineers to the point where, outside of paid anarchist cadres who bear no more resemblance to the left as a true American opposition, than do their distant cousins in academia and various, as well as various isolated and factionalized fragments of the traditional labor-based left who are largely without influence, there is no left left. One American left anarchist activist I am in touch with who refuses to renounce terrorism and is both a Muslim and an associate of Antifa is even openly unapologetic about his connections to the CIA. Be that as it may, not only does today's left have only the haziest idea of both traditional conservatism and classical liberalism, it also sees so-called white privilege under every bed. Given that the white race is no longer the majority population and therefore the standard human type in North America, it is high time that we started seeing ourselves as a bona fide ethnic group and begin searching for our roots like everybody else. Unfortunately, everybody else seems to oppose this move. Sadly so, if understandably since it might turn out to be a true service to human brotherhood. Blacks, Latinos, Muslims can have student unions and ethnic festivals, but never whites. Any white person who proposes that, since the white race is no longer top dog as securely as we once were, we should maybe begin to investigate what our whiteness really means, uh, what its essence might be, irrespective of our, of our fading position of racial dominance. Anyone like that is immediately classed with the Nazis, the Ku Klux Klan, and the white supremacists. And the unfortunate fact is that if I propose to organize a festival of whiteness, which I hasten to declare is not in my plans, the first people to show up out of, outside of Antifa and other far-left anarchist thugs armed with bags of urine and feces and baseball bats will be our own thugs, the Nazis, the Ku Klux Klaners, the white supremacists at least as nasty and possibly better armed than their leftist anarchist opponents. Defenders like these I can do without. How ironic it is that these great supremacists whose ideology has been used to justify mass murder are sometimes only beaten white separatists, people who are asking for little more than the equivalent of a white Indian reservation somewhere, maybe in Idaho or Mont Montana, where they can practice their ancestral folkways in peace. The fact that I risk five years in federal prison for conspiracy to protect immigrants to the U.S. from El Salvador, that I spent 20 years in a Sufi circle headed by a black man, and that my present colleague in the Covenants Initiative, Dr. John Andrew Morrow, is a Native American, will probably be nothing to the extreme left, since anyone who disagrees with them is immediately defined as a right-winger and therefore a racist but at least my checkered background will hopefully prevent, prevent me from being easily embraced by the extreme right. If I have been forced to face the darkness of this world, not as a member of a true nation in the sense of an organically constituted ethnic tribe bound together by blood and language, a sacred covenant between the living, the ancestors, and the land, such as many of the Native Americans still maintain, though under great duress, 
but as an unwillingly isolated individual, it is due to relentless historical pressures exactly like this. The Native Americans clearly have a greater right to call America our land than the European newcomers, but let them never deny that a white American, given the right circumstances, could feel a bond with this land every bit as strong as his older brothers and sisters of the First Nations. That's how I used to feel about my own homeland of Marin County, California, before, at least for me, the spirit of it died, which is why I now live in Kentucky, my wife's native land and that of some of my mother's ancestors. As for Black Lives Matter, more power to them in their fight to end police oppression and murder of blacks in the U.S., nor can I really blame them for venting their frustration against statues of white supremacist slaveholders. But when they begin to trash businesses of innocent bystanders, even those of members of their own community, how can any decent human being support that? They have even attacked at least one statue of Abraham Lincoln. And how long will it be before they start tearing down statues of Martin Luther King, that Christian Uncle Tom? If not Malcolm X, who had the cowardly audacity to call himself the slave of Allah. Nor does today's left seem to have the slightest notion of the true nature and purpose of illegal immigration, the un unregulated immigration that is knocking the white race off its high horse is something decreed by our globalist masters in their ongoing campaign to break up nation states so as to build their hegemony. As I said in my book, The System of Antichrist, Truth and Falsehood in Postmodernism and the New Age, the globalization of the elites leads to the balkanization of the masses. Nonetheless, we should never forget that many present-day immigrants to the United States, both legal and illegal, are simply running for their lives, often from conditions created or exacerbated by the global elites and their major military wing at the United States. We need to be as compassionate as possible to these people without seriously destabilizing our country and jeopardizing the rule of law. It is not their fault if they are being used by the powers that be to weaken national sovereignties and concentrate even more power in the hands of the elites. And we also need to remember that to create a second-class non-citizenship of illegal aliens vulnerable to deportation, afraid to assert their non-existent rights as workers, and so willing to work for next to nothing, is a strategy long supported by powerful corporate interests to undermine unionization and maximize profits. Today's so-called leftists have obviously never been taught that Cesar Chavez, a true hero of the left who co-founded the United Farm Workers Union in California in 1962, was opposed to illegal immigration for just this reason. As was the prominent American Indian movement leader Russell Means, who passed away in 2012. Nor are they paying much attention, apparently, to such developments as the displacement of many blacks by Latino immigrants from their uh, homes in places like Los Angeles, with the result that some of them are emigrating back to the American South. The rationale of the left and the liberal churches of the 1980s for helping Salvadoran refugees was based on the fact that they were fleeing their homeland partly due to the attacks of death squads funded and trained by the U.S. Therefore, we as American citizens had a duty to take them in. This is not an entirely accurate description, however, of the illegal immigrants of today. And so, far from being identified with the right or the left or the alt-right or the alt-left or the liberals or the libertarians or the neocons or the paleocons or the Maoists or the Trotskyists or the anarchists or the jihadists or the globalist co-opted romantic universalist Sufis or the globalist co-opted extremist cadre Sufis, I am actually a member of what might be called the alternate deep center. I reject liberalism, communism, and fascism. Um, beyond this, I am also opposed to postmodernism, globalism, and the global hegemony of the United States, including the U.S. NATO-based push to contain Russia, to provoke actions of Russian self-defense and then use these actions as evidence of Russian expansionism. To take only one example of this, the Russian occupation of the Crimea was in no sense an arbitrary act of imperialism, but rather a necessary move to prevent the U.S. from denying Russia its Black Sea ports which my nation was attempting to achieve so as to make it harder for Putin to intervene in Syria and move against ISIS, who at that point at least was precisely a U.S.-sponsored proxy army. 
This should not be taken to mean, however, that I believe that there is presently no danger to be feared from Russian expansionism, or that Russia is some kind of untouched and pristine heartland of traditional values and religion. The idealistic fantasies of Stalinist Russia held by the Western left in the mid-20th century are now fully matched in their unreality by the similar fantasies of Putin's Russia held by elements of the alt-right today. And so, to hell with ideology. Philosophy and metaphysics, as well as any true science, must seek truth above all things, or else lose their reason for existing. Ideology, on the other hand, speaks not in order to find and articulate truth, but solely to motivate action. When action serves truth, we are in the realm of religion. When truth serves action, we are in the hell of ideology, in the darkness of this world ruled by the princeps huius mundi. For the past seven years, I've been involved with an international interfaith Muslim peace movement called the Covenants Initiative, based on the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the world, published in 2013 by our founder, Dr. John Andrew Morrow. The, this initiative which I initially conceived of and which is designed to combat terrorism and protect persecuted Christians invites Muslims from all walks of life to accept these covenants as legally binding upon them today. It has been signed by many prominent Muslim scholars, including a representative of Al-Ajjar University, and has been endorsed by such dignitaries as Ayatollah Khamenei, Supreme Leader of Iran, Pope Francis, and Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Furthermore, when the Supreme Court of Pakistan acquitted the Christian woman Asiya Bibi on charges of blasphemy in 2018, the justices invoked the covenants as one of the elements influencing their decision and mentioned Dr. Morrow and the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the world by name. One of the most useful and significant things about the covenants of the Prophet is that while they are of great social use and import, they are entirely free from secular political ideology since they are in fact social documents authored under divine inspiration or the last prophet of this cycle of manifestation. They represent a seamless union of spirituality, morality, and strategic intelligence. In them, as in few other documents dealing with political theory and practice, the means and the ends are one. We are living in a time when the prevailing myths of modernism, whose three central pillars were Darwin, Freud, and Marx, with the darkly penetrating voice of Nietzsche breaking through to herald the end that a postmodernism in the distant future are no longer useful, no longer convincing. Under the rule of postmodernism, the established ideologies of the left and the right have also lost force, leading to the rise of the alt-right and the alt-left, whose theories and practices bear only a very uncertain relationship to the earlier dogmas out of which they developed or from which they degenerated. Nor do religious worldviews, except in various radically degenerated and ideologized forms, hold the same motivating and unifying power they once had over the mind of the human collective. In the face of the postmodern deconstruction of all articulate and self-consistent philosophies and of political ideologies, nothing remains untouched except the science of traditional metaphysics for the simple reason that it has nothing to do with the entropy of history, with time the destroyer, only with eternity, with the always so. The covenants of the Prophet Muhammad are perfectly in line with the science of metaphysics since they can legitimately be viewed um, you know, legitimately be viewed as an expression of the traditional metaphysical principle of the many and the one which is inseparable from the complementary principle of the transcendence and the imminence of God. Such secular ideologies as the rights of man, however, which derive from the French Revolution and its ideological precursors, work to turn humanity into an idol to be worshipped in place of God. Without a true sense of human dignity, no good can be done in the field of politics but only evil. The question is, will we attempt to base our conception of our inherent dignity on the human ego, either individual or collective, as in the case of today's identity politics, or on the human form as host to the Imago Dei, bearer of what the Quran calls the Amana, the trust?
According to traditional metaphysics, humanity is the axial being, the terrestrial reflection of all the divine attributes, which is why in Islam we are considered to be both Abd, God's slave, and Khalifa, God's fully empowered representative on earth. It is as if the secular doctrines of human rights see us as Khalifa only, while rejecting the God we would be Khalifa of, whereas the integral understanding of our humanity as, in Christian terms, co-heir with Christ and temple of the Holy Spirit, gives our duties and our rights equal weight, recognizing the legitimacy of those rights as contingent upon the fulfillment of those duties. And the fact is that no secular political ideology can grant humanity its full stature in these terms. Therefore, in my humble opinion, the only way for us to retain our human dignity while operating in the socio-political dimension is to base our view of the situation we confront and our role within it on essentially metaphysical principles. From this solid vantage point, we can judge which elements of the ideologies of either the left or the right are working to maintain and enhance our human dignity and which could only violate and degrade it. The greatest achievement of the devil in cultural and socio-political terms is to draw the sides wrong so that whichever side one chooses, damage is done and darkness spread. No degree of courage, self-sacrifice, and purity of intent can prevent a negative outcome once plans and actions based on a deliberately falsified conceptual map have been undertaken. Under such twisted conditions, all these undeniably positive virtues only compound the damage. But if we are grounded in, metaph in metaphysics and true religion, then God will choose the real sides, draw true boundaries between true alternatives, and establish rational and viable lines of action. There are many steps, contemplative, intellectual, psychological, and strategic, between transcendent metaphysical understanding and the application of transcendent principles to social action. Plenty of, plenty of steps. And no one of these steps can be skipped. But now that the ideologies of both right and left have lost their rationale, not to mention they're being manipulated by various global elites who believe they have transcended ideology entirely, though in the name of Lucifer rather than God, and so consider all ideological belief systems as nothing more than ways of controlling various sectors of the global population under the motto of rail politic for the rulers, ideology for the peasants, Anyone who wants to undertake social action with a solid spiritual basis must adopt a theoria based essentially on metaphysics and a praxis based on ethical principles with a solid theological basis. Thank you.